Hey everybody, Yogi Philosopher here, and um, for this introductory talk, I'm just going to say a few things just about who I am and what I'm doing with this whole, you know, Yogi Philosopher thing. And so pretty much long story short is that for over the past decade, I've been studying philosophy academically as well as practicing yoga. And now that I have my PhD and now that I'm publishing my books on philosophy, and now that I'm a yoga teacher, I want to use my, you know, over a decade of experience in both the academic world and the kind of yoga, kind of new age world um, to really turn as many people on to philosophy and yoga as possible. I've gotten a lot of them, a lot out of both philosophy and, and yoga myself. And so, yeah, that's kind of the purpose of this whole yogi philosopher thing that I'm doing, which is these YouTube videos, as well as like Instagram, Facebook, my website, my books, all that, all that stuff. Um, and so specifically, I'm trying to, you know, make philosophy and yoga more accessible to everyday people. But um, I'm also interested in facilitating a dialogue between the academic world and the yoga slash new age world. Um, I'm by no means the only person with, you know, a foot in each camp, as it were. But unfortunately, from my own experience, it seems that... Um, a lot of people, you know, there's still some tension, academics kind of being skeptical of the yoga world or new age stuff and then vice versa. Um, so, but that's just, you know, kind of big picture stuff. What I'm going to do for with this little talk is specifically talk about and describe my slogan, which is uh, philosophy and yoga for personal and global transformation. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll just take things one step at a time. And first, for uh, philosophy for personal transformation. So before I even knew that the idea of practicing philosophy as a, ther as a form of therapy, as a therapeutic practice, has a long history in the Western philosophical tradition, uh, I turned to philosophy specifically to get through a kind of a difficult time in my life. And from my own experience, I've found that the transformative therapeutic kind of uh, potential and efficacy of philosophy derives significantly from it consisting of a, of a specific kind of intelligence, um, specifically a kind of creative and self-reflective kind of intelligence, thinking of new ideas, you know, questioning presuppositions, which a lot of people um, can't do, you know, very well. I mean, it's uh, interesting how there can be some really, really, really intellectually smart people out there that are nevertheless um, aggressively closed-minded. And I don't think that's healthy. And so for me, as, as in, even though philosophy can be what a lot of people think of it as, like kind of like big picture out there, kind of whatever, um, philosophical intelligence is very, very practical. You know, it enables you to think of new ideas, you know, adapt to situations and, and you know, be self-reflective. And I found that to be incredibly useful for any kind of, well, virtually for anything. Um, philosophy is about learning how to think and not just what to think. And the more you learn how to think, uh, the more you can apply that to anything. And so that's kind of like, you know, it's philosophy, personal transformation in a nutshell is um, when you study philosophy, even when you just uh, talk about philosophy, watch philosophy lectures or talks like this, getting you to think differently, getting you to question things um, makes you more self-aware and creative, which is wonderful. And so but when you had... Now we're going to move on to yoga for personal transformation. And this, when it, when you throw yoga on top of philosophy and combine it, I found it just to be wonderful. And so um, I've always approached yoga primarily as a physical practice. I really, I'm not interested in meditating, uh, or at least, you know, the zazen, quiet, seated meditation. I like doing, I don't like, I don't like thinking too much when I practice. I just like to flow and to kind of get into the zone there. And so... While any number of physical activities can be great for you and, and you know transformative in its own way, uh, the transformative efficacy of yoga derives from how the physical postures are just part of an encompassing system, specifically with its own subtle physiology, like we see in the chakra system, which enables you to use the postures for very specific reasons. Uh, for example, I like referring to like deep, long-held hip openers as natural valium. You know, I find them to be very calming, very grounding, and stuff like that. So if you're someone like me who's kind of like I'm all you know in my head all the time and need to be grounded, you can specifically use a yoga practice, tailor yoga practice to your own needs to really not just get you to a good place, but also develop you, um, your tendencies and your habits in more long-lasting ways. So when 
added to the kind of creativity and self-reflection of philosophy, the yoga practice is just a great way to cultivate the kinds of self-transformations that you want to. Um, and again, this is, or maybe not again, but this is kind of all very basic stuff and I'm just, you know, uh, rapping about it. Uh, now, moving on, to <laughs> things are getting a bit, little bit more interesting with philosophy for global transformation. Um, this has to do with, this is a major theme in my second book, uh, which I'll talk about in another lecture. And it really derives from what is the power of ideas, the power of ideas, which I think is, again, a very simple idea itself, but often neglected. And one of my favorite philosophers, Alfred North Whitehead, summarizes uh, the power of ideas in a, in a nice quote. I'm not going to read it <clears throat> at full length, but pretty much what Whitehead says is, when you look at you know some of the great leaders in history like Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon, you know we wouldn't be here, who we wouldn't be who we are, where we are without them. Like these leaders have shaped our history in, in you know tremendous ways, but compared to the influence that philosophers have had since the beginning of philosophy with Thales in Greece, the influence that these leaders have had is pales in pales in insignificance. So. I think he also says at one point before any workman, you know, puts down a stone, you know, philosophy or, you know, ideas build cathedrals and they bring them down. So the power of ideas. And we can see this easily in like the example of heliocentrism, going from a geocentric world, you know, the earth being the center of everything to a heliocentric world, the, the sun being the center of everything, have tremendous social, political, religious consequences. So ideas matter. And again, this is kind of a simple thing, but the reason why I'm so kind of emphatic about it, especially in my second book, is it seems as though in our world only, or at least in our day, you know, contemporary Western society, only certain solutions are seriously considered, primarily legislative solutions or technological solutions. For example, like climate change, like in order to combat climate change, let's create laws to protect the environment, let's create new technology to, you know, whatever. And that's all well and good. I'm not, you know, negating that, but it, um, it's for me, it is symptomatology insofar as it kind of only treats the kind of secondary or later effects of deeper underlying issues. And for me, as I, as I argue in the second book, the deeper underlying issue is the kind of materialistic secular paradigm and or worldview in which we live that most people really, really never question. And they have a lot of difficulty questioning. Um, and so pretty much where I'm going with this is as the creation of new ideas, as the evolution of ideas through our self-reflection and all these things, philosophy is essential. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it has had, it's played an essential role in our history. And now it is vital for our, frankly, for our survival as a species. Um, and so a big part of what I'm doing in my work is kind of not just explaining this, but also like serving as an example of the power of ideas. And we'll get to that um, later. And so finally, uh, yoga for global transformation. And this, even more than philosophy, uh, may seem a little far-fetched, but here's what I mean by this. Uh, and this code, uh, this comes from another major theme of my second book which is that the sources of the contemporary crises that we're dealing with in the 21st century, I'm specifically thinking about the mainstreaming of fascism, as well as the destruction of the environment, the sources of these crises, and by the sources, I specifically mean the toxic ideas, as well as toxic values that drive these things. That again, like you can't just legislate away. You can't just technologically, you know, evolve yourself away from these. Um, these toxic ideas and values are so deeply ingrained, not just in our institutions and our cultures and even um, our history, but they're so deeply ingrained in our bodies that they literally pre-structure the way we think and the way we perceive the world. So again, the, sor the sources are kind of invisible to a lot of people because they pre-structure the very way we think about and perceive the world. Um, and so it's kind of like the cliche of the horror movie, the call is coming from inside the house kind of thing. So the, the problems are in a way directing our very solutions to the problems or the sources of the problems are directing our, our solutions. Um, and so we can understand how, you know, how does, how, how our body, how are, you know, our bodies, you know, you know, corrupted by these toxic ideas. 
Um, and we can understand this by the, uh, the theory of, or not the theory of the science of epigenetics. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of epigenetics, we are not determined by our genes. So your genes do not determine you in a kind of a mechanistic fashion throughout your life. Um, pretty much how you, ex your experiences of the world, how you perceive the world de determines or at least influences which of your genes are expressed. However, the interesting, it, the interesting thing uh, is your ideas, even further than that, your ideas and values influence your perception. So if you follow this train of thought, our ideas influence how we perceive ourselves in the world and our perceptions and our experiences of ourselves in the world then determine our genes and our genetic expression. So it's in that way that, um, you know, ideas can kind of influence or, you know, shape our bodies. And so for Nietzsche, especially, it's Christian ideas, life negating nihilistic ideas, like negating this world in order in, you know, uh, to gain salvation in another world, these kinds of life negating values and ideas have been so deeply ingrained in us that we are all kind of Christians in a way. Um, and so pretty much uh, this, and obviously this is where the yoga kind of comes in is if that's the case, if in order to change our world, um, we need to change our minds and we need in order to change our minds, we need to change our bodies. Then that's where the yoga practice really comes in. And so by each of us working to rid ourselves of these kinds of you know, toxic image or toxic images, toxic ideas and values, uh, and specifically what I'm talking about in the second book is we really need to start dealing with the generational trauma that patriarchal orthodox religion, is plural, uh, have inflicted on our species. And that's where the yoga practice that we each do in kind of, you know, recreating ourselves physically, emotionally, as well as psychologically and spiritually that's how we can get the kind of sustained and significant cultural progress that we need in the 21st century. So that's pretty much it. Um, you know, anyway, uh, thank you so much for just, you know, checking this out. I hope this was interesting to you. Uh, and if it was, you know, please, you know, like, you know, subscribe for future notifications about videos, uh, cause I'll be doing a bunch of them as time goes by. Um, and also if you have anything else you'd like to say, any comments, you know, please leave because I have a few ideas for lectures that I'm going to do about my, my two books coming up. Uh, but I would also love to hear what you guys have to say. Cause again, this is kind of just me using my experience to talk about what everyday people want to hear about. Um, and so that'll help me kind of tailor things to where, uh, things should go. So anyway, thanks so much. I'll see you later.